So I'm going to follow on from what Catherine was saying and uh, when she showed that kind of matrix about EV, uh, evidence-based medicine, evidence-based policy, I'm going to zoom in a bit on, and think about what those different types of evidence mean within uh, evidence-based policy. I think when sometimes evidence is talked about, there's an idea that evidence is kind of self-evident and that we all know what that might be. But as kind of Catherine talked about there, there are different types of things going on which are treated as evidence at different times. And I'm going to kind of zoom in a bit here and just very briefly talk about a case that I looked at, in fact, to do with uh, climate change policy, which on the surface looks like it's very heavily based on scientific evidence. But when I looked at it, it re I realised there was quite a lot uh, of other stuff going on there and that the scientific evidence part was playing quite a different role to what one might imagine. Um, and I'm going to draw on some kind of slightly older ideas from someone called Carol Weiss, who some of you might be familiar with, who is definitely one of the kind of the most enlightening researchers, I think, on evidence-based policy. It did a lot of work in the 80s and 90s. And she kind of played with this idea that evidence-based policy was a, a path to enlightenment. And in fact, she argued that sometimes it might be a path to what she called endarkenment instead. And I think in my... Uh, the case I'm going to talk about here about local climate change policies, the climate policy in local authorities, um, this was actually what happened um, in the late, uh, kind of a, the end of New Labour and the start of the coalition government. And what Vice uh, described was three different types of uh, evidence. So she talks about ideas as evidence, and she talks about um, the idea of arguments as evidence, and she talks about the idea of data as evidence. Um, I'm going to briefly show some examples of these three and uh, talk about how they worked in this case and then uh, illuminate essentially that the idea of political argument as evidence was very much underplayed in this case and this was essentially why uh, local climate change policy was one of the reasons why it essentially died out in the early years of the coalition government. And I think there's some quite important parallels with the Brexit vote and how we might understand evidence going forward after Brexit. Okay, so on the face of it, climate change is like a shining example of evidence-based policy, uh, contrary to what uh, some of uh, Paul's climate scientists might think. Um, so this is a, a kind of, uh, you may remember this uh, gentleman, it's, uh, David Miliband. So this was from 2007, it's kind of like peak new labour, if you like. And he was uh, at the time he was uh, in charge of climate policy. And this was just after the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, I just put out one of their brick-sized uh, assessments of climate science. So this is like a, an enormous, you know, this is the opposite to kind of Paul's uh, book. This is like an enormous, thick uh, brick of evidence which uh, is dropped down to policymakers to assess, mainly in this case around atmospheric physics. And uh, he says that the, he said that the report represents the most authoritative picture to date, showing that the debate over the science of climate change is well and truly over. And what's now urgently you need is international political commitment to take action. And this report by the IPCC can provide a strong evidence base needed to move the prospects of agreement closer. So this is a very clear uh, description of how um, scientific evidence and data can prompt political action. So we have the evidence and then we move into policy. Uh, and this, of course, is a very kind of globally framed argument. Climate change and uh, certainly climate science is, is uh, thought about in a global way. And then this kind of filters down to national and ultimately, in the case I was looking at, uh, to local levels. And again, just to reiterate the fact that scientific evidence is really at the heart of climate policy. So this is the first page of the Climate Change Act, which was uh, passed in 2008 in the UK. Um, and it talks about, it puts into law the idea that the UK is going to cut its uh, carbon emissions by 80% by 2050. And as you can see there, just a highlighted bit there, so there's only two, uh, um, there's only two circumstances in which the Secretary of State is allowed to change this baseline. And one of those is if scientific knowledge about climate change uh, evolves in any way. And the other one is about European or international law, which itself is very wedded to scientific data. So really, the idea of scientific evidence is really at the heart of this, you know, it's kind of lashed to the idea, it's, it's practically impossible, according to this act, that you can actually change the target without there being some change in the scientific evidence. 
I'm not aware of any kind of closer marriage between evidence and policy, but there is certainly in the UK uh, arena. So it seems like you know, this couldn't be any better if you were interested in evidence-based policy. And for local level, these, uh, this target of 80% then filtered down to further targets for local authorities to cut their emissions over a certain, certain number of years. So all, it's all very kind of rational and it all kind of stacks inside each other like Russian dolls. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a beautiful, beautiful rational thing. But what was interesting about this was this really, this data actually didn't play that big a role in the end. What this data did was actually built up the idea that climate change was a problem that everybody had to tackle. But in fact, when it came down to the data, a lot of local authorities didn't actually trust the data that much, particularly at the local level. And this is what was interesting for me, is I just assumed this data was taken for granted. And when I started to talk to some of the people at local authority level, they started questioning how good the emissions data was. So this brings me on to the second type of uh, evidence. So this is the idea of political arguments as evidence. And this is very much what was missing in this, uh, in this case. So we've got a powerful consensus around this idea that climate change was a problem. Um, but this was not the same as a consensus around uh, policy. And uh, the focus on climate science uh, within, which we saw in the previous slide, really kind of established conditions for consensus and thinking about con uh, policy as a... Uh, thinking about consensus around climate policy. But what this kind of missed out was that actually when it comes to tackling emissions, this is a very political and a very contested area. So, you know, we can think about emissions, uh, carbon dioxide emissions as kind of a very generalised scientific idea. You know, carbon dioxide is the same whether it's in uh, London or whether it's in, uh, on the other side of the world. But the social things which lead to those emissions are very different. And that's the political bit which was very much missed out by what we saw on the Climate Change Act. So what did this mean when it came down to think, talking to kind of people who were dealing with the evidence at a local level? So this is a slightly lengthy quote, but this was a, someone who's had to deal with this at a local level. What did this, uh, what did this evidence and policy entwinement mean for them? And he said that I think one of our problems with general public, who talk glibly about climate change, why do they need to bother about climate change? They just need to know about practical things that can help them improve the quality of life, like energy efficiency, saving money on fuel bills, etc. This is not to say that climate change is not a big problem. The point about this here, what this kind of shows, and this was an officer who I would say was very committed personally to thinking about uh, addressing climate change, and in a very sympathetic local authority at the time. What this shows is that the argument bit has been missed out. So there's been so much focus on the scientific data as part of the evidence base and looking at the emissions, not enough, enough attention has been paid to making a political argument. And this was part of the evidence base that was missing. Indeed, going back to Carol Weiss, so this is, um, she says um, that political argument is necessary in order to bring along the organisations and ind individuals who will carry out your decisions. There's a continuing need for legitimisation. So it's all right having a policy, but if you want to implement it, essentially, political argument is crucial. And where this really kind of clashed out was when it got to 2010, when the coalition came in and obviously local authorities suffered big budget cuts, Climate change policy, by and large, at local level, did very badly. So only uh, in a survey in 2010, uh, early 2011, sorry, only 35% of local authorities had maintained the same commitment to, to climate policy that they had previously. Essentially, the political arguments were not there to support it when the going got tough uh, compared to some other policy areas. So that's evidence, uh, so it's ideas as evidence and arguments as evidence. So finally, I just want to talk about the idea of data as evidence. So just going back to what I said before, this was kind of something, so there was an assumption at the start, certainly by me when I was doing this research, that this data was, kind of, you know, was taken for granted. In fact, this again was what one of the climate change managers said. So this is, the robustness of this data is very questionable anyway. Uh, your carbon footprint in the whole area, there's so many inaccuracies within this whole exercise when you're trying to carbon footprint your own authority, let alone an area. Quite mind-boggling when you factor it up. Yet, they still all uh, adopted this data, which was kind of uh, a bit of an eye-opener, really. So even though, I mean, not all of them, but certainly a significant number of authorities really questioned how good this data was, but they still used it. And the reason for that 
was that essentially they had to use this data, otherwise um, they weren't seen to be taking climate change seriously. So uh, the way that the local authority um, policy was set up at the time, they had to use these indicators, national indicators as national data in order to get resources. And this steered them towards certain policies and away from certain other policies. Um, so 186 is the name of this data. Um, so our view was when 186 came out, well, we're not going to say no because we've been asking for this for a long time. But we have no resources and we have no control. So even though uh, they have no resources and no control, they still need, they still decided they wanted to go down this road of uh, using this data because this was a way of gaining it. Uh, and finally, as one more manager said, so the power of using this evidence and using this data was in fact to raise the profile of climate change within the, within the performance management they had at the time. And it's an indication of the commitment to the climate change agenda. So in fact, in this example, the actual numbers themselves, which you would think on the face of it was the important part of the evidence, wasn't that important at all. It was actually the kind of the act of, of adopting this was what was important, not the numbers themselves. Sorry, and just to say that so the, the problem with this was that um, when they used this data, it steered them towards certain things that they had no control over, as you can see at the top there, and away from things they did have control over. So the numbers included things like industrial emissions, which local authorities really had very little control over, but they actually steered them away from things which were harder to measure scientifically, but they had more control over, such as landfill emissions, which at the time uh, weren't measured nationally, but uh, was actually one of the few things that local authorities could measure. So it was really steering them down some policy cul-de-sacs, the notion that they had to use this quantitative data to drive a policy. So, just to finish, um, there's a couple of lessons here. So, um, Vice's lesson, which I hope has come out a little bit from this case that I've, I've kind of speedily whizzed through, is that a good evidence base means weaving together ideas, arguments, and data. And in this case, around climate change policy, uh, we had the idea that climate change was a problem, and we had data, uh, which has come from central government, but the political argument part was rather sadly missing. So it looked like there was a strong evidence base, but it wasn't robust enough to stand up politically when the going got tough uh, around austerity. And it wasn't, it didn't prove to be a priority for local authorities. What's this got to do with, Bre well, I think there's, uh, what's this got to do with Brexit? So I think there's some important parallels here in that there was a, a great emphasis uh, during the Brexit campaign on experts, and quite famously there was a poster that came out showing all the experts who were uh, in favour of uh, staying in the EU and all the ones who were against and there was nothing in the against column. Um, I think the lesson here is that, well, the lesson I took from that certainly, is that political arguments, uh, especially particularly fierce ones around Brexit, cannot rely too much on data. So you can't just rely on expert uh, opinion and you can't just rely on uh, quantitative data to make your argument as a lot of economists did and a lot of immigration experts did. You have to have locally relevant political arguments. So I certainly do not go along with all the kind of post-truth uh, trend that thinking that, you know, at an extreme that Brexit means the end of evidence-based policy and that we're in a kind of like post-factual world. But it should mean, and I think it should mean a renewed focus on building evidence bases that are scientifically robust but also politically robust. And to remember Vice's lesson that this requires a lot of different types of knowledge.